Hello everybody. Welcome to Western Civilization. Today we are going to be working on um, Unit 5 and talking about society in Europe. Today we're going to consider some of the important systems and institutions that existed within the framework of medieval Europe. And I cannot stress enough that although these systems and institutions provide an interesting way to consider and think about Europeans during this time period, they are neither wholly accurate nor entirely indicative of Europeans during this time. As in all eras and in all places, there were plenty of exceptions, and no two counties, towns, or fiefdoms looked just alike. There were myriad nuances and flavors within the labels that posterity has placed upon the people who lived in Europe during the Middle Ages. But, as good historians, we're going to look at the sources and try to make some educated guesses based on the evidence. Welcome to Mr. Garris's students. This is the part of each class where we take a moment to consider what's being asked of us and how we can best ensure that we capture the information in the lesson in a way that will help us to achieve our goals. Here are today's learning expectations. Because you are being asked to explain two systems and the characteristics and relevance of markets, what sorts of things would you need to capture in the lesson to do that well? Try to think about how you should structure your notes and then take a moment to set your notes up in a way that makes sense to you. At the end of today's lesson, you will be able to explain feudalism as a social system, explain manneralism as an economic system, explain the characteristics of a medieval European market and its relevance to both the feudal and manorial systems. All right, so let's start with a definition. Merriam-Webster says that feudalism is the dominant social system in medieval Europe in which the nobility held lands from the crown in exchange for military service and vassals were in turn tenants of the nobles, while the peasants, also called villeins or serfs, were obliged to live on the Lord's land to give him homage, labor, and a share of the produce in exchange for military protection. I often find that vocabulary makes a lot more sense to me if I put things into my own words. So take a couple of minutes to write this definition in a way that makes sense to you. Find a person or an object in your immediate vicinity and see if you can explain feudalism to that person or object out loud. Once you're ready, you can start this process again. All right, welcome back everybody. I think you have just explained feudalism to somebody else, hopefully out loud. If you did, good job. If you didn't, please stop and do so now. My classes know, because I talk about it quite often, that I received a feeble history education as a student in high school. And here's example number 562. My teachers taught me that the feudal system was a social pyramid that looks like this one. King on top, peasants on the bottom, nobles and knights in the middle. Everyone knows their place. Everyone is happy-ish, but not so. This is truly an oversimplified version of a very complex and changeable social system, and it really doesn't explain anything well. So let's watch a quick video that explains how feudalism works. Feudalism is a term invented in the 19th century to describe how society was structured during the High Middle Ages. That's between 1000 and 1300 AD. The feudal system was based on the exchange of land and services. Under the feudal system, all the land in the kingdom belonged to the king. He would then parcel out large estates to great lords known as tenants-in-chief in exchange for their military and political support. These great lords then parceled out smaller portions of the land to lesser lords on similar terms, who did the same to local lords, who did the same to peasants. 
the feudal system had its own vocabulary. A king or lord who gave land to a lesser lord became the latter's overlord. The person receiving the land became the vassal of the person who granted it, and the land itself was called a fief. A vassal was not necessarily a minor figure. Everyone in the feudal system below the king was a vassal, even the greatest lords in the land. Even the king of England was a vassal to the king of France for the lands he had inherited there. By the later Middle Ages, though, feudalism had largely disappeared from Europe. This was the result of a number of factors. Firstly, medieval kings grew less reliant on their great lords to provide soldiers for their armies, turning instead to professional paid soldiers. This weakened the bonds of feudalism built on the obligation to provide military service. Secondly, the Black Death, which arrived in England in 1348, significantly reduced the population available to work the land. Those who were lucky enough to survive the epidemic had increased bargaining power and could increasingly choose where they worked and demand higher wages. This meant that the nobility gradually lost their control over the lower and middling ranks in society, who could now afford to buy their own land. Finally, increasing urbanization and a greater reliance on a money economy rather than a land economy also contributed to the decline of feudalism. So, to recap, the great lords were no longer expected to provide military service to the king. The peasants were increasingly free to live and work where they wanted, and money replaced manpower as the key agent of economic and political power. Whilst feudalism declined in England from the 14th century onwards, it was not formally abolished until the Ten Years' Abolition Act of 1660. In other European countries, the end of feudalism came much later. France abolished feudalism after the 1789 revolution, and Russian peasants had to wait until 1861 to be made free. Amazingly, the last remaining traces of feudalism in the British Isles made it into the 21st century, until finally abolished by the Scottish Parliament in June 2000, with the abolition of feudal tenure act to take effect in November 2004. So in my feeble high school brain, it all started with the king, but not so. I say, how does one become the king? One conquers or inherits a kingdom with the support of, you guessed it, the nobles and the knights. But for argument's sake, we will say that the king was already in place. He grants lands and titles to his nobles, the people who support him both financially and militarily, if needed. The nobles can't do all that supporting by themselves, so they grant parts of their land to their vassals and knights. By the way, a knight is just a fancy word for a cavalry soldier. He's nothing more or less than a paid warrior. Vassals and knights are too busy administering and fighting to do much farming, so they in turn give smaller tracts of land called cellions to farmers and craftsmen in exchange for a portion of the harvest or manufacturing process. As you can see by the left side of the pyramid, the peasants are the people who make everything. The things they grow or make then pay for fancy armor for the knights, nice clothes for the nobles, and taxes for the king. Essentially, the entire system rides, as most social systems do, on the labor of the peasants, those who work. However, it's not always so straightforward. Peasants could. And did refuse to work for corrupt or cruel vassals. They could demand a larger share of the harvest, or they could sometimes move away to a city and become a laborer. These scenarios were a noble's worst nightmare because without his peasants, he couldn't pay his knights or his taxes, and his land and title would be given to someone else that could. Because of the interconnectedness of this system, it was really important that everyone uphold their end of the bargain. So important, in fact, that oaths and legal documents were drawn up to ensure that the system was maintained without interruption. All right. So, in your notes, this is what we need you to get down. It's really, really important to realize that the term feudalism is a modern construct. 
No one in 13th century England said, I am part of the feudal system. Historians made the term up to explain and simplify the system that was working in lots of places in medieval Europe. Historians have used this term to explain all sorts of different systems that look similar to the one in the diagram to the right, in Japan, in China, even in Russia. The basis of feudalism is the exchange of non-monetary items and services that are primarily dependent on land for their creation. Take a look at this list. First, there is the land itself. Land was the basis for titles of nobility. The more land you cared for, the higher your title. Ostensibly, the king was in charge of the whole kingdom. He parceled the land out to the nobles based on their importance to him personally and professionally. A king might think you are a wonderful human, but if you can protect him from invasion, he's not going to give you land on the border. Secondly is a link to the next bullet. Agricultural products are by nature intrinsically linked to the land. Without well irrigated and drained land that is productive and well cared for, there could be little to no agricultural productivity. When seen through this lens, land can be seen as valuable because it could be used to grow things. Throughout the Middle Ages, Europeans developed, borrowed, and stole technology that enabled them to make better use of their lands. Over time, irrigation and drainage techniques improved, bringing even more land under cultivation. And of course, the more land you have under cultivation, the more people you need to work the land. Through effective use of technologies that improved land use, medieval Europeans were able to expand the feudal system. Next on our list is agricultural products. This was really the backbone of the medieval economy. As agricultural technology flourished from contact with Asian and African cultures via the Silk Road and the Crusades, Europeans began to utilize their land much more effectively and efficiently. Kingdoms were made and broken based on environmental factors. A long winter or a cold rainy summer could and did wipe out huge portions of the population to starvation. During one particularly hard year, 50% of the English population was lost to famine. Agricultural products were varied, but throughout the period, a dependence on grains and grain byproducts was the norm. During the mid and later medieval period, greater diversity of food sources, including the introduction of a variety of beans and legumes, led to increased nutrition and better ability of the populations to withstand lean years. Domesticated animals and their byproducts were an important part of this social system. The people needed to care for flocks, milk and process the cheese and butter, Shear, spin, and weave the cloth from wool were all essential members of the feudal community. We will talk about this at length in the final segment of this week's lesson. But the ability to trade agricultural surplus products for coin via markets and fairs enabled all segments within feudal society to buy necessities and luxuries alike. Next bullet, manufactured products. We really don't often associate manufacturing with medieval Europe, but there were some important manufacturing processes at work within the feudal system. Every fiefdom had to have somebody making horseshoes, swords, and all the other accoutrements of war necessary to outfit the knights. The process of making cloth was another essential manufacturing process that was at work in homes and small shops within Europe at this time. In fact, Wool cloth became ubiquitous with England during this period. Keep in mind that these manufacturing processes were not occurring in factories like we imagine, but rather in homes and small shops. Individuals carried the knowledge of these processes and passed them down from father to son and mother to daughter. This was not a formalized, industrialized process, but rather something we call a cottage industry individual people making the products they and their communities needed, basically inside their homes. Next are services. The service in industry was in its infancy during the medieval period in Europe, 
But even as the smallest of all sectors, people in this group were an important part of the system. Doctors, lawyers, and priests were essential for the health and well-being of communities. Although people who provided services were respected within their communities, they would still be classified as peasants unless they held titles of nobility, as was the case with the tiny minority. This is one of the faults historians point out with the feudal classification system. It just doesn't make room for those who are not directly or intrinsically connected with the land. Finally, we have security. Those who provided security are romantically classified in films and books as, you guessed it, knights. Although they, there were knights, to be sure, they comprised a tiny fraction of the group who provided security. Remembering that the basic, basis of the feudal system was the king, quote unquote, giving land in exchange for protection and taxes. It was by definition essential that the nobles who controlled fiefdoms, both large and small, be able at a moment's notice to provide their promised troops for the king's cause. Because of this reality, it was not uncommon for swords and helmets to be provided in times of need to farmers, shepherds, and townsmen alike. These men and boys were expected to fight and, if necessary, die for the fife and for their lord, as they had promised in their oaths. This created, in many places, an us-against-the-world kind of mentality. It also creates a system in which conflict is not only likely, but is absolutely necessary to justify the expenditure of money on an entire group of people. Without conflict, there would be no need for security. And these people are an, an integral part of the social system. So let's bring this all together. Loosely held, the feudal system meant that everyone had a place within society. They were born into their jobs, and by extension, their place in life was determined largely by the work done by their family. Everyone's job mattered in this system. The king needed the nobility for the money and men they brought into the kingdom. The lords and nobles needed the king to provide them with legitimacy and land. The land the lords held had no value without the people to work and make the land productive, and without knights and others to protect the land and the wealth that the land produced. The peasants, artisans, and service personnel needed the land that the Lord parceled out to provide sustenance and a roof over their heads. Everyone needed another's labors. The job of the king was to rule, the job of the nobles was to stay in the good graces of the king, and the job of the knights was to train and prepare for wars. The job of the peasants was to produce. It all fits neatly into a little package, except, as I alluded to already, it tr didn't truly fit the reality of the situ situation. Where do we put a wealthy merchant without a title or no nobility? Where does a farmer fit who owns his own land? How about a blacksmith who has not pledged fealty to a lord? What about a woman who lives alone in the woods and gets paid for herbal remedies? There are documented cases of all these exceptions to the rule, and as a whole, historians have chosen to ignore their place within the social order. Hopefully, you will be able to do better. All right, you have earned a well-deserved break from my voice. Please pause the video and complete the feudalism primary source analysis. This document is designed to help you better understand how feudalism works in actual practice, how it connects to the parallel government of the church, and it asks you to rethink the system on your own. Once you complete the analysis, you can restart this presentation. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed working on your primary source. In your notes, I'm gonna ask that you write the answers to these four questions. If you're unable to adequately articulate the answers to these questions, please re-watch part of the lesson that you missed. Question number one, what type of system is the feudal system? Number two, why does a pyramid not accurately represent feudalism? Number three, how does a feudal system lead to perpetual conflict? And number four, what is the primary source of wealth 
in a feudal system. As soon as you've got those answers, come on back. Our second concept this week is the concept of manorialism. Manorialism is defined as a system of economic, social, and political organization based on the medieval manner in which a lord enjoyed a variety of rights over land and tenants. For our purposes, we, once again, are going to need to simplify this just a little bit. We're going to classify this as a political and economic system. It is intrinsically linked to the feudal social system. They're like peanut butter and jelly. Neither one can exist without the other. Well, technically they can, but why would you do that? But I digress. Okay, so manorialism is what happens economically and politically inside the fife. Its purpose is to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the fife to ensure that productivity remains high and the fife remains safe and ready for any eventuality. Watch this video. The music is lovely and the subtitles will help give you some good information about manorialism. Hopefully you enjoyed that. So what we see here, sorry about that, hold on. All right, sorry about that. So what we see here is kind of a, an artist's rendition of what they think a fife would look like. We think this is pretty accurate and based on archeological um, evidence and the work of a lot of historians, it would seem to be at least very close. So what does it take to have a successful manor? Well, each manor is gonna be slightly different. Some are coastal, some are hilly, some are large, some are small, but they all need the following ingredients. So you'll wanna get these down in your notes. First and foremost, they need a good water source. Without water for crops, people, and livestock, there is no fife. 
Land that is cultivatable is really essential. Remember, the entire social system of feudalism is tied to the land. So is the manorial system. So both of these are tied essentially to the land. Just as important is some type of living wood source for burning and building. A town is essential to the system because you need places for dwelling and for conducting business and trade. The church was essential as we've established in the last few weeks. It provided the parallel moral guidance system that supported the social, financial, and political systems. You can't have a fife unless you have laborers. It's just no good without the people. And we saw some interesting evidence of that. Following the Black Plague, so many people died that laborers were able to earn huge gains in both their rights and wages because they became so valuable. So labor is really going to change tremendously over the period that we call the Middle Ages. And then, of course, in order to have a successful manor, you have to have somebody who's in charge. So that could be a noble or in some cases, um, manors were owned by abbots. Um, by the by the church so you've got either a noble or an abbot and that person could either be a religious or a secular leader depending on whom the king had chosen to rule the fife their responsibilities to the king were an essential part of the manorial system as with any discussion of history it's really important to remember that things change over time that is particularly true when we talk about agricultural practices during the medieval period. Innovations and in information moved throughout Europe via the humans that carried the information, slowly but surely. It's really hard to quantify, but possibly the most important innovation in agriculture that grew up as a part of the manorial system was that called the three field system. In this system, you plant arable land in thirds. One third of the land is left fallow, which means unplanted, each year, while the other two thirds are planted. In the early Middle Ages, one third would be barley and one third would be wheat. We'll return to the crops themselves later. This one third division of land was a huge innovation because it enabled farmers to replenish the land using their grazing animals and the natural fertilizer that they produced. Just imagine herds of cows, sheep, and goats eating all day and expelling their waste products. This led to tremendous gains in the yields from each plot and an increase in surplus goods each fife could produce. The arable land itself was then divided into smaller and smaller parts called furlongs, which are long strips, and ceilions, strips within the long strips. These furlongs and ceilions were divided with shrubs, stone walls, and ditches to ensure that peasants maintained their own land properly. A peasant who didn't care for his land properly would lose it. Okay, so let's return to the barley and the wheat. The problem with both of those crops is that they are cereal grains, good for carbs, for beer, for bread, but not particularly nutritious in the long term. In the early Middle Ages, people subsisted on a diet of grains, which we all know is not particularly good for you. Over time, information began to trickle in from the East about a new source of food, beans and lentils. This was a game changer in several ways. Beans provided nitrogen back to the soil in which they grow, and when they were introduced into the soil, they made the three field system even more productive. They also provided a much needed source of protein into the diets of medieval citizens for whom the availability of meat was scarce. By the end of the Middle Ages, this became the norm with one field being fallow, one planted to beans or lentils, and one planted to cereal grains. This led to huge increases in population and a decrease in the amount of people who died during the lean years. The soils of Northern Europe were particularly difficult to cultivate with a high clay density and lots of rocks that heaved up to the surface during the yearly frosts and freezes. Cultivation was more than just a challenge. In addition, large tracts of land were swampy or wet, a killer for cereal grains that rot easily in wet ground. In the early years, farmers did what they could using wooden implements or iron tipped implements. The results were nominal at best. 
Over time, however, farmers began to hire blacksmiths to create plows that were made entirely of iron. These were called heavy plows. Heavy they were indeed, too heavy for a human to pull through the ground. This innovation needed some help, and help came in the form of the horse collar. Invented in China, this handy tool took the pressure from the rope and transferred it to the strong collarbones of the horse, enabling these handy animals to pull tremendous loads that previously would have choked them to death. Thanks to trade along the Silk Road and through the Mediterranean city-states, we believe these innovations made their way to Northern Europe sometime around the 12th century. These innovations, three fields instead of one, new crops with higher nutritional and better land replenishment value, and technologies that make agriculture possible in the North were game changers for the manorial system. This brought new areas online for settlement and were such a game changer in the increasing power of the kings. All right, it's time for an activity. To help you better understand the manorial system, you're going to decide which person gets which parcel of land on Lord Denever's new fiefdom. There are a couple of clues at the bottom to help you make your decisions wisely. Pause the presentation now while you complete your choices. Once you've finished, you can start the presentation back up. Welcome back. Please answer these questions in your notes. If you're unable to answer these questions, go back to the presentation and take a second look at manorialism. Question number one. What type of system is the manor system? Question two. What is the purpose of the manor system? Number three. What innovations made this system successful? And number four. What is the relationship between the feudal and manorial systems? The feudal system and the manorial system were in many ways independent of one another. Each little area was semi-autonomous and able to remain self-sufficient for the most part. However, with all systems, nothing is completely autonomous. This led to a need for exchange. The king was not going to accept bushels of wheat in payment for his taxes, so nobles needed a place to generate specie. This is a word for hard money or coin money. That opportunity came primarily from two sources, markets and fairs. Markets were regular occurrences, monthly, seasonally, or weekly. The frequency and placement of markets was determined by license issued by the king. Kings were really careful with these licenses, realizing early on that granting of markets would enrich certain nobles at the expense of others. In England, for example, the king's market was a consistent and ongoing affair in a little town called London. This led to increased settlement, increased taxation, growth, etc. Voila, London becomes London. Kings licensed themselves and their friends to get riches and power in exchange. They also licensed nobles whose fiefs or knights had the best chance to help and benefit the king with his goals and aspirations. Fairs, also licensed, were bigger and less common than markets, and these licenses were even more coveted by nobles. Fairs could attract merchants and goods from far afield. They occurred rarely and were much larger than traditional medieval markets. All right, so this is what I want you to get in your notes. Why markets and fairs mattered. Let's take a quick look on at a quick video on medieval markets. This is Norwich Market. It's a busy place that sells different goods from all over the world. But markets have been around for hundreds of years, and they didn't always look like they do now.
This is how Norwich looked about 500 years ago. In those days, there were no planes or trucks to transport things, so farmers took their own goods to market. We would have had to go up incredibly early in the morning to harvest crops and then maybe load them into baskets or to, um, to bring them in, uh, maybe walking up to 10 miles to get to a, to a market. This is a, an important once weekly activity or occurrence that we just have to do. It's how we survive. And this is what the market might have looked like in those days. Usually a market would have developed around a crossroad between hamlets or villages and people would have met there and bartered and exchanged product for product. I bring along a chicken, you bring along some apples, we can swap them. As a civilization, we soon learned that you didn't have to be able to grow and manage everything yourself, that you would specialize. Many of the peasant farmers would have more products than they actually physically needed to survive and feed their family, so the excess they could sell or exchange. They didn't have the same variety of food we have today, but some things were the same. Life was based totally around the seasons of the year. Everything was seasonal. Carrots were usually purple or white. The orange carrot doesn't come in for another few hundred years. it would have been a very vibrant, colourful and smelly place. A lot more animals and livestock around uh, being walked to market as well. You certainly at the time wouldn't take meat to market pre-cut. You would actually take the animal and possibly slaughter it at the market as well. If you had an outlet, to perhaps to the sea, you were fairly close to one of the major ports where ships from around the Mediterranean came in, you could bring in all sorts of exotic products to that market and that, to that region. They would have come across as luxury goods. Markets became important places, which over time grew into towns. Other sorts of trades and shops would have soon built up around the market. We are likely to find old taverns and inns, coach houses where the coaches and horses would actually be able to have been stabled. The marketplace will also be a place of uh, punishment. A town at the time would have to have stocks or a pillory. Ultimately, the town itself builds up around the market. So if our farmers from the past visited Norwich Market today, they'd be amazed at some of the things they'd find. All right, hopefully you enjoyed that. I enjoyed that one. Let's see, let me get out of there. Oops. Okay. So markets had a huge impact on both the feudal social system and the manorial economic political system. Taxes. First and foremost, these markets generated the money necessary to pay the taxes. The nobles were able to sell their surplus for cash. The farmers and artisans were able to do the same. In an economy dominated by the non-monetary exchange of goods and services, this provided a chance to generate actual money from those items. Next is access. The market was a mixing of all segments of feudal society. Everyone within a fiefdom and in neighboring fiefdoms would attend this exciting event. 
As a result, people who normally would not have access to goods suddenly had the opportunity to buy them. Silks, swords, carrots, and peas. The sky was the limit. Depending on the size of the market or fair, there could be merchants and goods from as far away as Asia or Italy in areas as far north as Norway or Scotland. People like nice stuff and yummy food, and this led to demand for more of these goods. Next is status and wealth. The bigger the fair or market, the more important the lord or abbot who hosted it. These licenses were hard to get, and if the king granted one, it meant that you were important. By extension, everyone who contributed to that fiefdom was also important. They had been a part of that success. Wealth was another important component. Fees were generated from the merchants who came to sell. Wealth was generated from the goods that were sold. Tourism. In a post-Roman world without games and chariot races, opportunities for entertainment were few and far between. Markets and fairs became the social event of the season. They also provided an intersection of church and secular, as a market in a town with a leg bone from a saint could become a tourist destination. People were more likely to journey to a town that had both attractions rather than those that only had a market. As in modern times, tourism was a booming business. Markets and fairs helped to spur this sector to new heights. And finally, opportunities for learning. This area of social history can often be overlooked, but we need to remember that knowledge is the single most powerful commodity of all. New technology, new products, and new ways of thinking were all propagated at markets and fairs. Booksellers and storytellers alike were regular features of these festive events. All right, it's time for some more exploration of the sources. Stop this presentation and complete the medieval market's primary source analysis. This analysis will give you an opportunity to look at how markets worked and why are they are so important to the medieval world. Once you're done, you can start the presentation up again. Welcome back. Please answer these questions in your notes. If you're unable to answer these questions, go back to the presentation and take a second look on markets. Question number one, how did markets and fairs combine feudal and manor systems? Number two, what type of goods were sold in European markets? Number three, what groups of people participated in markets? And number four, what role did the king play in market activities? Once you've finished your questions for your checking for understanding, you should have a good sense of our three goals for today. Our first goal was to explain feudalism as a social system. Our second goal was to explain manorialism as an economic system. And our third goal was to explain the characteristics of a medieval European market and its relevance to the feudal and manor systems. I hope you've enjoyed this week's lesson. Remember to upload your assignments and notes with your checking for understanding answers to Google Classroom. You are wonderful and amazing humans. I miss you. I hope you are well, and I hope you have a great weekend.